and I. This is Eric. I'm here alongside with Cobrin and Aaron, and we have a special guest today, Charlie Simons, here at the Cook Inlet Council on Alcohol and Drug Abuse, otherwise known as Cicada, which is nice because that's kind of a mouthful, I will say. Um, so, Charlie, I know also one of your positions at Cicada is also kind of a mouthful, but as I understand it, you are the medical assisted treatment for opioid use disorder counselor, and that may not be 100% correct. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about Cicada. All right, great, thanks. Yeah, um, so Cicada has been a substance use provider of outpatient treatment on the peninsula for quite a long time. Um, I've been working in this field since 2006, so I've been able to in that time I worked with youth, I worked with uh, adults and residential, outpatient. Um, I worked in our prison system for a little while, uh, kind of kind of every imaginable sure. kind of population and, and uh, area. So at Cicada, um, you know, while providing substance abuse assessments and running multiple kinds of different therapy groups, men's specific groups and youth groups and kind of some co-ed groups, uh, I'm also working with this special kind of population of, of people who are on medically assisted treatments. So that's my role is to kind of bring in, develop, and support that specific population. Sure. Um, just to backtrack a little bit, I know when I was talking to my brother, and you know, before we do some of these podcasts, we try and do a little bit extra research, you know, on the programs that we're going to be looking at. And I think one of, I said to my brother, I said, maybe you can tell me like from your perspective, like what is like something special about Cicada? And to try to sum up what he said correctly, he just said, it sounds like they're very versatile. You guys kind of do a lot of different, like specific things from adolescence to adults to MAT to just like different classes, inpatient, outpatient. Um, is that correct? You know, it's kind of hard to sometimes gloss yeah. over what we're trying to look through. Is that, sure. would, would you say that that's kind of correct? Yeah, like, um, um, mostly. I mean, we, we don't have a residential or inpatient okay. Okay. Uh, component to Cicada. Um, but I think all kind of good substance abuse providers really are trying to find, hey, how can we get this information or this support out to our communities? And so if we're open to that, we do end up being pretty versatile. Yeah. I, something I kind of forgot to mention here at the end of the school year, Kenai Central High School reached out and said, hey, Charlie, we come over and speak to our health class. Sure. We're doing a substance abuse thing. And it, historically, it's been pretty difficult to get into high schools. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and I know there's a lot of reasons for that. Right. And the alternative school... Um, has invited me over there. I went over there as part of, part of their summer program. I'm going to really have a, a, a presence and a place there throughout next school year where I can provide counseling within that environment. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, it's a unique opportunity that Cicada has been available sure. uh, for our community yeah. to, to provide. Yeah, that's, that kind of, I guess, hits home a little bit for me in one way. Um, I've taken classes at KPC, and I'm in the UAA psych program, and each year, uh, Dr. Sellers will come in and just teach a class or two, and some are, no offense, Dr. Sellers, if you ever hear this, some are kind of dry, you know, they're like research methods, you're like, yay, research methods, Unless and other ones are like stats for psychology, you uh -huh. know, she teaches some of those, those quantitative ones, uh -huh. but then, you know, she also will come in and teach, like, I took health psychology with her, mm -hmm. you know, I took a... I didn't take this class, but I know she taught like clinical psych. And so I think like just to hear that, you know, somebody that's really like invested and in doing some like hands on work in this field and it's like kind of bringing more and more education to the youth. You know, I know that Dr. Sellers, like some of those classes have really like impacted my ability to like understand some other things. So mm -hmm. I don't know, kind of a rabbit trail, but I think that's really cool that you're able to do that and get mm -hmm. like into the youth and bring a little bit more maybe modern and I know like just from talking to you some more evidence-based um, information you mm -hmm. know so yeah. that's really cool um, you said the medication assisted treatment population so what exactly are these medications treating 
what is that attempt? Mm -hmm. You know, let's just maybe start there. Yeah, so medicated assisted treatment is, is just what it sounds like. That sure. Is there a medication that can assist in somebody's treatment? And the primary, um, you know, substance use disorders that we're looking at are the opioid-based disorders mm -hmm. that... You know, it certainly has grabbed our national attention. There's so much overdose death around opioid use that it's actually going to change the projections for life duration wow. Wow. in this period of, in our history. Wow. It's, it's super yeah. profound. Yeah. So we're kind of like, oh, maybe we should do something about this. <laughs> right. it, it takes years for things to really happen, to get evidence-based, to develop the medications, to say, hey, I think this is working. But it is so profound that, that, that researchers and, and nationally in every state, they're looking to see what can we do to help people suffering from opioid use disorders. So that's the primary um, target. Um, however, we have medications that assist in alcohol use disorders as well that have been around for a number of years. Um, so both of those, and sometimes in conjunction, the same medication will work with both. Sure. What are some of the popular or most known medications for opioid use disorder? Well, really, we have three nationally that are most popular, and methadone is on that list for a harm reduction. You're not looking for drugs on the street anymore. It's supposed to be really clinically based dosages and has really helped people kind of get away from I'm, I'm seeking drugs on the street and engaging in the criminal behaviors, and now I have this more guaranteed way to manage uh, an addiction. And there's some other things about methadone that's different than like on the street heroin that sure. makes it more... Um, uh, people more able to function in life mm -hmm. than that than that real up and down high of, of heroin. In our communities, we mostly are looking at Suboxone and Naltrexone. And Naltrexone is our our daily oral medication, and it's called Vivitrol okay. when it's in the 30-day injectable. Okay. Mm -hmm. So those are our primary um, medications that we use uh, in this community. So. In researching some of the Suboxone, we came across that it is a partial agonist with, it's kind of a two-part medication, right? So mm -hmm. it has a word that the three of us have tried to say all morning, yeah. buprenorphine, 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 and naloxone. Yeah. And the buprenorphine is a partial agonist, meaning it's like kind of fitting in this key. If the receptor is like a lock, it's like yeah. kind of fitting, but not completely enough to mm -hmm. kind of take that withdrawal away but not necessarily enough to really produce that euphoria that respiratory depression mm -hmm. and then the naloxone helps so it kind of puts a little bit of a ceiling on that on that high i guess so it's pretty mm -hmm. it's kind of a, a well i guess high is not the right word but it puts a ceiling so that if it is was to be like misused it's not so readily so it's kind of a prevention combination it seems like it is okay. yeah so so we want to we want to um, reduce diversion is the term we use, right? If I if I'm going to um, a doc and they give me 30 days worth of you know Suboxone to take home, that's pretty popular on the street. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and people like it. I've talked to lots of people. They have two or three strips in their wallet just in case they can't score, right. and they don't want to they don't want to have that withdrawal. So they'll have them handily you know ready in case they in case they need them. So naloxone is partially a diversion. Um, because, no, and, and you're right, buprenorphine is the term. Suboxone is a kind of a brand name. Sure. And, and that brand of Suboxone has that combination where, like, Subutex is just buprenorphine. Okay. It doesn't have the mm -hmm. naloxone on it. Okay. So I don't want to give any addicts any heads up here, but right. <laughs> they already know anyway. Well, <laughs> I mean, well, yeah, Subutex, gonna, people, gonna... will, people will, they're clever, they're, they're engineers, they're chemists, nice. and... They'll shoot Subutex, even though it yeah. comes in a film, yeah. right? They know how to, to shoot that. Yeah. Well, with Suboxone, you can't do that because of the naloxone piece yeah. to yeah. it. So chemically, it doesn't work that mm -hmm. way. So uh, a full agonist is, like methadone is considered a full agonist. So okay. A drug that gets you high yeah. potentially is an agonist. It fits there, and you're getting the, the, the full effect of what that drug has to offer you. Yeah. A partial agonist has what you're talking about, really has this ceiling on it. Um, now, I know uh, part of the things that make medically assisted treatment um, work is I'm ready for treatment. 
Mm -hmm. So any medication in the hands of somebody who's not using it to achieve a recovery or stable or quality of life improvement sure. is still a drug. Mm -hmm. right? And I'll have that conversation sometimes with people in here like, well, my medications, I'm like, nah, you stop calling them medications when you start smoking them. Right? Yeah, That's yeah. very different, yeah. very different thing. Mm -hmm. So the, the partial agonist has this ceiling and it says it's going to fit into that receptor so that I don't experience the withdrawal. Okay. Right, our brains yeah. have really created a new normal because of our drug use, and it helps me kind of stay within that that area, so I don't have that discomfort. Um, and at the same time, it kind of takes it off the table to where I um, it's harder to abuse, okay. right, because of those two components to suboxone. And then we have the the antagonist, mm -hmm. which is you know our Vivitrol. Yeah. Vivitrol binds with those opioid receptors harder than opiates can. So it's the key that yeah. fits in a lock but doesn't unlock the door. Okay. Right? And yeah. so, but no other keys can fit in there. Yeah, right? yeah. And I've had guys tell me, they're like, well, it worked. I'm like, what do you mean? It's just like I went and spent 200 bucks on dope, didn't get high. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we know it works both, you know, through, through medical research and people telling me that it works. Right. As you said, the... The medication assisted treatment part of that were that you know that this treatment um, so when we spoke on the phone last week or a couple weeks ago, it sounds like the medication assisted treatment is kind of a you know a concurrent two part thing you're getting this medication you said that evidence shows that some of this that people on medication stay in therapy longer mm -hmm. and being in therapy is good you know so I mean I won't try to paraphrase all that you said but maybe you can mm -hmm. talk about kind of that that duality or for lack of a better word you know that that two part mm -hmm. component to this yeah you know absolutely. what that takes and what that medication is doing because if treatment alone was all you needed we wouldn't mm -hmm. we wouldn't deal with the medication and that's that's definitely one of the reasons why they see such evidence for the use of suboxone as a medication assisted treatment sure. Um, is it helps people stay in treatment longer. Mm -hmm. and, and the longer people are in treatment, the better outcomes we're going to have. Sure. Right? And so that research is very clear. Um, this statement, and, and I have it in front of me from SAMHSA, about medication-assisted treatment, they say, is the use of medications with counseling and behavioral therapies mm -hmm. to treat substance use disorders yeah. and prevent opioid overdose? So you can yeah. see there's some components to it and some targets yeah. to what we're looking for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and and um, so we see a, a drop in drug-seeking kind of behaviors and all those mm -hmm. criminally associated kind of behaviors sure. and uh, a drug or an, a decrease in, in the craving and the withdrawal that keeps people using for yeah. so long. It is probably the number one reason when I'm asking people why are you still using when you know it's, it's harming your relationships, your quality of life, whatever. Mm -hmm. That fear of withdrawal is so powerful for the yeah. opiate addict. Mm -hmm. um, and this allows them a doorway Right, and uh, it increases some nice contact, right? If it's done right, they're seeing a physician, a medical provider regularly, sure. mm -hmm. right? So we got yeah. all those other kind of associated things that they might have, have on board because yeah. of their lifestyle yeah. that can get attended to, mm -hmm. and it increases the time that they're engaged in treatment. Yeah. So outcomes are, are, are just better for the population that this is the fit for. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I, some of the stuff that, I was reading to research a little more was that the uh, maybe the US maybe the recovery world the therapy world in general is maybe in the last 10 years coming around on this it was kind of maybe a little bit the world the recovery world was a little bit hesitant about some of this I know in I think what I read was in that the famous Betty Ford Clinic they were an abstinence-only program. They were not going to work with people on medication-assisted. They're not going to provide that treatment. And then in 2012, they said, never mind the evidence. We can no longer. I actually read in this article, one of the chief medical officers or one of the main people in charge there, they said, I had to step out of my own past recovery experience, and I had to acknowledge the evidence. And I thought that was... Hard. I mean, I thought that would be challenging. Another from a person who had been using and then was on the medication in the same article had said they were stuck in kind of this collective idea, this collective ignorance, maybe, 
for lack of a better word, in that, like, and I also see, have seen, you know, on different things on the internet, and I don't mean to be, like, inflammatory here, but I think it's good that we be somewhat open about this and that, like, subs aren't clean or Suboxone isn't clean. So it's, like, there is, like, some stigma around this, and the world is just now starting to have having to really acknowledge some of this evidence. Have you seen some of those barriers, some of that, those challenges in your practice? Yeah, absolutely. And what you're talking about, too, is not just a, um, well, it's on multiple fronts. Yeah. Right? So it's a, a collective belief about what recovery has been. Sure. Right? And, and as we talk about, you know, the, the Hazelton or the Betty Ford, the 12-step model, um, that is super effective, and we know it's super effective. Yeah. So when there was kind of a belief that um, seemed to conflict with this model, then we had got to find a way to make it fit or to work because it's saving lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the guy is saying, you know, in that, um, it sounds like you put it very nicely. In our most recent um, Alaska Addictions Conference. We have this annual school every year, and they, they always bring uh, into state some very educated and, and good speakers and people that are on the forefront of what's happening. And because opioid use has been such a nationwide topic, that's really what its focus was. We had some guys that just said the same thing, and they just said, the evidence is so overwhelming that if you're not offering this to the people that you're working with, you're doing them a disservice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? And that spoke volumes to me. Here, and here are people, right, with their own 12-step experience that grew from a different kind of model, yeah. uh, and it's not the right fit for everybody. But if we're not offering it to people, then maybe we, we want to rethink where we're coming from. And, I, and at, to, uh, at the same time, it's not the right fit for every program sure. either. Mm -hmm. So even within socially and our national kind of change as providers... Right? There's maybe some, some pre-biases or some, some ways I saw it before that maybe I want to rethink. Mm -hmm. And then also for the people that are on Suboxone, for example, yeah. or medicated-assisted therapy, and that's primary, one of the primary reasons why I have an MAT group in this facility is because they're facing those kind of stigmas or bias nationally, and then I want them to go to a 12-step meeting where it's not accepted either, right. yeah. which so we know is... Double stigma. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they're getting stigma from the, from the people that are like the only ones that can know what it's really like for them, yeah. and, they're, and, they're, and then the national kind of overall social stigma of that. Yeah. That's definitely a challenge. So do you... Go ahead. Do you think that's, that is more related to mindset? Because the way I see it is that maybe the time that we started viewing addiction as a disease rather than like something that you're just weak in, I guess. Mm -hmm. Maybe that kind of coincided where they're like, hey, wait a minute, if this is a disease, maybe we can, you know, medically treat it like other diseases. So do you think that's been kind of playing into the acceptance of this, of like, hey, maybe these people are sick and they're not just weak? I mean, that sure makes a lot of sense, right? If I, am a, if I have a medical condition and there's a <laughs> medical help yeah. right then it makes sense that you should probably take that medical help to get to mm -hmm. right a, a relief or a mm -hmm. uh, an improved quality of life there's such a long-held belief in our in our recovery kind of communities it makes me think of a time it was a number of years ago where i was talking with uh, a nice lady who had like 40 years sober in AA, right? Yeah. And she made this comment to me she goes i tell my people if they're on those antidepressants they got to get off of them so here is the same kind of mirrored belief mm -hmm. system, which is really, and, and I'm like, oh, they're not what they maybe used to be, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe we want to rethink that, that kind of belief system. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't necessarily know what, what the docs prescribed for antidepressants 40 years ago where she was from, um, but it's not what they're doing today. Mm -hmm. and, and we have real evidence that says antidepressants <laughs> are okay to take while you're in recovery, right? Yeah. We wouldn't even think that today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that was a belief, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of decades ago. So there's certainly a changing attitude about this, this I don't want to say medical model, because that's not necessarily true, but that there's medical components to our, our recovery process that, that need to be um, yeah. So do you think that, that um, 
feeling of like of previously I guess long held beliefs in that sense of like oh this is not okay do you think that kind of overrides information because I mean when you describe it as like an agonist or you really break it down mm -hmm. into its logical steps it's like okay that's totally different you know but I guess also uh, the fact that it is abused can contribute to that mm -hmm. so how do you overcome that like how do you get people to trust that it works within a specific framework sure. but the I mean that's just a tough balance mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. for sure so um, the way we're really approaching it the way I'm approaching it the way Sakata is approaching it uh, at this point if I have people like and I want to use a 12-step community or 12-step process for somebody's recovery process where they have this nice um, you know, a lot of people to choose from that understand them, that get them, that want to help them recover. And a bunch of those people abuse Suboxone, yeah. right? They might yeah. go, uh-uh, yeah. nope, that's not clean, because right. it hasn't been their experience of clean. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. So one of the ways we're addressing that uh, in this, our MAT group, it's really intended to be a peer-run group. And that's the way... Um, Hopefully I'm getting to all the, all the answers kind of for the questions. Mm, totally. When, when our nation uh, sees there's a problem, they're like, hey, we got to do something about this. And they start shoveling federal money right. towards developing programs. And so our state goes, yeah, yeah, th our nation's on to something, so we want to have these, these programs. And so they will write, hey, I want, I want treatment providers who are willing to do this to apply for this grant to do these things. And they kind of outline how we're going to do that mm -hmm. based on some evidence that we know nationally. Right. So part of our grant to do this says we know that a peer support kind of group works. So it's still facilitated by me, but okay. they really run yeah. the group as much mm -hmm. as possible. Okay. <clears throat> so ultimately what will happen, and because um, I know from, from doing this for a long time, I've worked with people who have been on Suboxone for a long time, living really good, living good lives, and yeah. they are navigating a 12-step program because they've been selective about who knows this thing that is a stigma. So the people yeah. they're close to, that they've selectively chosen, these are the people that are gonna know everything about me. They've selected them on the basis of knowing this non-judgmental kind of informed people. Mm -hmm. okay. So as soon as I get a group of five or 10 of these people in our community that can tr teach each other, show each other, support each other and how to navigate that community while on medications, um, then, then we're going to have a growing kind of population, and it, and it will change the understanding kind of from the inside out. Yeah. I don't think there's any way that we can go into a 12-step community and say, hey, here's the evidence, look at this. Right, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. right. Yeah, it sounds like um, before, early on, what you said, you said, because that wasn't their experience. And it sounds like now one of the fundamental things that you're going to be doing is giving people entirely new experiences. Absolutely. I, I think the it's pretty new in our community sure. how we how we do this. Um, one of the one of the models we use is called a hub and spoke model that was really successful in Vermont, mm -hmm. another kind of community that spread out. Mm -hmm. So we have to be able to access other community supports. There's no entity in our community that, can, that will do it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, that, and we've been historically kind of siloed mm -hmm. um, where each agency has tried to do it themselves. Yeah. Right? And, and for a lack of resources, really, so it's the best we could do. Mm -hmm. um, but, but there needs to be a shift here. And this hub and spoke is there's people, there's docs that are providing and working directly with treatment providers that are doing the treatment. And we're working with other agencies, the reentry coalition, the whatever, to access other resources because they're not in one place. Sure. So the way that now that communication, um, it, it forces communication. So some docs, as they're, as they're prescribing medications like Suboxone, they have real specific requirements about how this is going to go down, and people see real successes when it's that way. And that mm -hmm. is the SAMHSA, the national standard for how it's supposed to be done. So if you come into my clinic as a doctor or a prescriber of Suboxone, we're going to do the medical stuff, we're going to make sure you're a right candidate, we're going to you know, do some initial assessment and make sure it's a good fit, then you're going to come back tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? And I'm going to give you one dose. Mm -hmm. And you're going to hang out with me because I'm going to make sure that there's yeah. nothing wrong going on, yeah. all right? Everything's stable, everything good. 
come back tomorrow okay. and I'll give you one dose. And this goes until you show me that you're invested in a recovery and I'm not going to give you 30 days right. and send you yeah. out the door because you came in and said, I, 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 I want Suboxone. Yeah. And so, so there's a, a process that's in place for how you earn a week worth of medication. And part of that process is, you know, in conjunction with our, our national definition of medically assisted treatment is, is that you're going to treatment somewhere. Mm -hmm. that you're getting that psychosocial support, yeah. that there's a therapeutic component. And, and if there's not, then we're going to revisit, are you a right fit? Right. Yeah. yeah. So do you have people that really resist the structure element? Because, I mean, I'm sure that's something difficult, mm -hmm. but do you just work with them through that? Or is that one of the terms you're like, maybe this isn't a, a good fit because... So again, that, that's a really new kind of conversation because as, as a treatment provider, um, our policy of our agency is, is to provide treatment unless certain things are going down. Like if you're not showing up, if you're right. coming up loaded, if you're bringing weapons, right. like there's some right. things that are just yeah, off right. the table we're yeah. not going to do. Yeah. Um, but how long somebody is on Suboxone, whether they're on it or not, that's a doctor, that's a doctor-patient conversation mm -hmm. yeah, right, um, right. Th that I don't have. I just mm -hmm. stay informed of. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. 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 So let's uh, community-specific. Somebody, somebody wants to get into a medication-assisted treatment program. What's one of the first steps? Um, do they come to you? Do they yeah. go to the doctor? I mean, you know, I'm sure there's a few different ways, but mm -hmm. for people here you know, on the Central Peninsula, Kenai, Soldatna, Kasilov, Homer, you know, sure. how, do our, how do our listeners do that? Yep, yeah, great. Um, so I guess it depends on maybe their connections. Um, we're, we're more and more kind of a, a self-informed community and population. Mm -hmm. So if you get on the SAMHSA website, that's the Substance Abuse Mental Health uh, Services Administration. It's our national kind of warehouse for information and direction. And they have a state-by-state -state map for all the Suboxone providers. Okay. Right? So that's one route to go. Mm -hmm. So you can look on there and say, hey, this is a provider I've been to before. Or they're just down the road. That's one route to go. You can give them a call and see if, if you can get in with them. Um, another route is you already have a personal physician and you're asking them about it, right? They could probably refer you to somebody. Okay. Okay. If you come to a substance abuse provider, like, like if you come to Cicada, there's going to be some things that are going to tell me that I want to have the conversation with you, mm -hmm. right? If you have some alcohol use disorders, cravings, withdrawals, whatever, um, a high relapse potential, if you have opioid use disorder, then I at least, you know, like we talked about before, I'm doing you a disservice if I don't have that as part of the conversation. I don't ever tell anybody they have to. Mm -hmm. I don't ever say, well, this is an, M I want you in my MAT program, so you better get on, you know, some right. medication. Right. I just offer them the basic information about what it is, uh, what they can, you know, some, provide them some information so they can make an informed decision, and then I'll give them some information about who to call to mm -hmm. start that process. And then they'll let me know, right, if that's the thing they want to do or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if it is, then I'll, then I'll provide, you know, a treatment program for them that is person-centered around that treatment sure. goal. And do, do you have conversations like with providers about kind of what you're doing and so if somebody comes in that they might refer somebody to you or at least give somebody your information? I mean you guys mm -hmm. are, you and other Suboxone providers are kind of working together in some ways to try to create yeah. and bring this together? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And some, as you might imagine, some, some providers um, just shut the door. Yeah. Just hang up the phone and go, nope, we're doing what we do. Yeah. We don't, we don't care what you do. Yeah. And others are, are, are very um, collaborative and we have a lot of regular contact and, and we find that that's the best fit for the people we're working with. It gives them the best support yeah. um, to succeed. Yeah. So can you, if somebody wants to get in touch with you because I know to get in touch with the provider, they can get on the Sam Show website. That's probably the easiest. Mm -hmm. If somebody wants to get in touch with you regarding the MAT uh, program or regarding anything Cicada related, mm -hmm. how would they do that? Maybe a phone number, an address, an email? Yeah, the phone call is probably the best just okay. to the Cicada front office. And Jennifer okay. up there will, 
will ship you to me or, or the appropriate person, depending on what your question is. Okay. Um, yeah. Do you know that number? No. No. Oh, Aaron's <laughs> got it. Is that nice. number? It is. It's a two eight three three six five eight. Yeah. I don't ever call here. Two eight three three six five eight. Three six five eight. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. anybody that's listening that wants to get in touch with uh, Cicada for the MAT or anything um, Cicada related, that's the Cook in the Council of Alcohol and Drug Abuse. That is. Can you say that, Aaron? I don't want to. Yes. Yeah. So there's a location in Kenai. Uh, 10 200 Kenai Spur Highway. Um, the phone number is 907 283 3658. And there's also a location in Homer as well. Mm -hmm. right? That location in Homer is 1230 Ocean Drive, unit number one. And their phone number is 907 235 8001 or 8001. So, two locations to get into if you have any questions or want to get in feel like you need to get into one of those programs, for sure. Yeah, and just a side note, if you use Google Maps, it'll take you straight to Walmart, so <laughs> it's on the way there, it's it's on the right-hand side. It's just but... a little past the Walmart. Yeah, in oh, Kenai, yeah. it's right next to the old Pizza Hut. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, <laughs> were, yeah what you, I guess, what used to be the Pizza Hut. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, thank you so much, Charlie. Um, if you have any last words... Um, I think um, just one, one other thought, there's something you kind of brought up earlier, and I don't know if we really touched on it uh, clearly in our conversation. When people, um, when people engage in a Suboxone or a Vivitrol kind of medication, like I was taught right on, we want to have an exit strategy. People aren't in treatment forever, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's meant to be uh, a support for their quality of life, right? And that's, for some people that might be forever, but that's not really the standard. Mm -hmm. So, um, there's some national kind of evidence that says, boy, if you're on Vivitrol, it's best to do this monthly shot for a year. And some people will say more, some people will say less. It's very much a person and provider kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. Suboxone, the same thing. Some providers out there nationally are saying, boy, we, no, these, these guys need to be on it forever. Right. And that is not necessarily the strategy that, that everybody's taken. Mm -hmm. Locally, a popular strategy seems to be um, we're going to get somebody stable and improve quality of life, engage them in a recovery lifestyle. Then we have the conversation about reducing the amount of medication they're on. Just recently, somebody from, uh, from Hazleton at an a opioid conference said, you know the right, when somebody's on the right amount of Suboxone, you don't know they're on medication. Okay. So you yeah. should not have somebody on the right amount of the box and who's nodding out in your conversation right. or in your group. Yeah. Right. That's not the right fit. And if I have somebody doing that, we have a conversation with the doc that says, hey, we need to readjust this thing because yeah. that's not improving quality of life. That's sure. not what the medication's about. Yeah. So if somebody is doing that and they're telling you, oh, it's my doc or whatever, yeah. and then we have, some, we have some miscommunication. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So around here, when somebody is stable, we have the conversation generally, and I'll have it right away if somebody is on a medicated assisted therapy, what do you want that to look like? Mm -hmm. Right, Because I, I want them to know that they're going to have support through that exit strategy if that's yeah. what they're going for. Yeah. And some of our docs around here, they move in that same direction. We want an exit strategy, we have improved quality of life, we're not dependent on any of these sociological or physiological kind of addiction pieces anymore. And if somebody gets to the end of that taper and they use again, then they might be want to revisit about our duration of length. Right. Mm -hmm. But the real duration of length is really person specific. It's a conversation to have with each individual and their doctor, perhaps their treatment provider to get support through that, mm -hmm. you know, change. So I yeah. think that's an important part of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. I know Coburn and I were discussing that idea earlier of, you know, thinking, Oh, okay, I'm going to do Suboxone. There's all these other, you know, questions you might ask when you're about to do that. Um, and then you get into this, if somebody says, oh, this is going to be something you take forever. That's like, whoa, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm, you know, mm -hmm. to not be so eloquent. I don't know if I'm trying to take a medication for the rest of my life, you right. know. So it is, uh, thank you for touching on that, you know, not necessarily. That's not the first step, it doesn't sound like. It sounds like that's much more a... Uh, last step kind of kind of deal maybe 
or yeah. at least not the first. Right. So. Right. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much, Charlie. Yeah. I appreciate the opportunity. And if any questions are out there about Suboxone or what's available, feel free to give me a call. <laughs>